Good morning. morning. What a joy to be together this morning, and uh, boy, that final song, uh, that's kind of what it's all about, right? That's why we're here this morning on a a Sunday morning, and um, I'm just eager for the the words of that song to be true for us uh, over the course of the next few weeks. I'm excited about the things that we're going to be looking at together as a a body and, and praying that they will just take root in our hearts and that the Lord will uh, show us His glory in the person and work of of Christ. Uh, This week we're going to be in 1 Peter. You can turn there in your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to be focusing this morning on a lifestyle of obedience and and the holiness that should flow out of our salvation. Peter wants us to see that sanctification is the natural result of a heart that's motivated by the great price that Christ paid to redeem us. And then we'll come together on Friday, a good Friday, as we look at the scriptures and just have a sober reminder of exactly what it is that Christ endured for us. On Easter Sunday, we're going to come, we're going to jump back into to John chapter 2 and uh, just this little section where we see that the disciples remembered the promise, remembered the prophecy that Christ made of his own resurrection, and then the incredible change that that resurrection made in the life of the disciples. And then on April 23rd, we'll go to John chapter 3, and we'll consider what it means to be born again, Nicodemus question, right? And so I hope, at least in my mind it does, I hope this all flows together for us and just points us to the cross, and points us to Christ, and points us to the sanctification uh, of life that should flow out of that. I just encourage you to to pray for uh, me, pray for us as a body, and especially pray uh, Good Friday service, Easter service, that uh, any who might be there or who are visiting um, who don't know Christ, uh, that the Spirit would work and would move through His Word and, and bring people to a realization of what Christ has done on their behalf. Well, I appreciate uh, Nick reading for us and uh, getting us ready to go here in in 1 Peter. I think one of the things that we want to remember um, as we come to the book of 1 Peter is to remember the circumstances of the original audience. And um, 1 Peter is written to a group of believers who are facing escalating persecution. And Paul is writing to help them to understand how they can live victoriously even in the midst of all the hostility that's taking place. And uh, I I trust that as we go through this passage this morning, you're going to find some encouragement. Uh, Maybe you're going to find some exhortation if you need it. As I put this in the context of this original audience, uh, some of my uh, excuses, my complaints tend to kind of melt away. we have, uh, we have a, a three-part outline. Now, I'll, I'll give you the outline here, and then we'll talk a little bit about kind of the, the culture or the setting of First Peter. Uh, three-part outline is verse 13. We're going to focus on a life of hope. And verses 14 to 16, a life of holiness. And then verses 17 to 21, a life of honoring God. A life of hope, a life of holiness, and a life of honoring God. And Peter is encouraging these believers that they can have hope. They can can live holy lives even in the midst of hardship and persecution. They they can live God-honoring lives. And, of course, we're privileged to live here in the the good old U.S. of A., right? America. It's easy for us to forget as we come and gather on Sunday mornings in our comfortable building with our cushy seats that persecution is taking place around the world. And we ought to be mindful and we ought to be prayerful as we gather of the fact that in more than 40 nations around the world today, Christians are being persecuted for their faith. In some of those countries, it's illegal to own a Bible, to share your faith, or even to teach your children about Jesus. I was reminded this morning even of a woman that we knew who served for decades as a single woman, as a missionary in Afghanistan, and hearing her tell of taking a taxi to go somewhere. And as she's in the cab, she begins making conversation with the cab driver, 
And, and as the conversation progresses, she has to weigh each time. Like, is, is this an opportunity? Is this a moment where I could broach this subject, where I could bring up the gospel? But understanding that there are serious inherent risks and fears that go along with that each time she considers doing that. And there are believers who are boldly following Christ in spite of government laws and radical opposition, and they can face harassment and arrest and torture and even death. And yet Christians continue to meet and continue to witness for Christ, and the church continues to grow even in restricted nations. And the epistle of 1 Peter is written near the outbreak of persecution under Nero. An abuse of Christians is terrible under Nero. According to the Roman historian Tacitus, under Nero, Christians were burned alive or savaged by animals and spectacles before a Roman audience, sometimes covered in wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs. They were nailed to crosses. They were lynched without trial. They were imprisoned and racked and seared and broiled and burned and scourged and stoned and hanged. And tradition counts Paul and Peter among Nero's victims. And it's in this context that Peter encourages his brothers and sisters to a life of hope and holiness, showing them that even in the midst of this kind of persecution, they can live in a manner consistent with their salvation and they can bring glory to God. Jump around with me real quick here, just a, a few verses to kind of give us this overall summary, overall message of the book. First Peter, first look up in uh, chapter 1, verse 6. It says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Jump forward to chapter 2, verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Chapter 3, verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? And then chapter 4, lastly, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. <clears throat> Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. So as we go through this passage in 1 Peter, I just want to add to it the, the weight of an audience that was under real persecution, severe testing and trials. Look at verse 13 with me. Therefore, okay, stop right there. This is uh, normally we do verse by verse preaching. Today we're going to be we're going to be doing a word by word preaching. So if you need to uh, order in a pizza or something, no, we're not we're not going to do this the whole way through, right? But we we got to stop at the word therefore because you Bible study aficionados, right? Those of you who are in, in Jack's uh, Sunday school class and you have been uh, introduced to my friend Herman Udick, uh, you, know, you know that when we see the word therefore, we have to ask a question. What's the question we have to ask? Well, what's the therefore, therefore? And in this case, the therefore summarizes everything that's been said in verses 3 to 12. You understand how this works, right? If, if we're in the foyer and, uh, and I come up to you and shake your hand and I say, therefore, you owe me $100. You're going to say, wait, what, uh, there, therefore, what, what was before the therefore, right? So in this case, in verse 13, we look at verses 3 to 12 and th verses 3 to 12 form one great sentence that is basically a list of God's blessing to his saints, things that he has accomplished for us. And so we see all these blessings that God has given to us, the redemption that we have, and then therefore. This is how Cranfield puts it. Because, kind of, kind of calling back to you, can see these phrases in verses 3 to 12. He says, because God has begotten you again to a living hope by the resurrection of Christ from the dead, because you have an incorruptible inheritance 
a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, therefore. And Peter's doing exactly what we see so often in the New Testament epistles. That is, he is laying down a solid doctrinal foundation so that it can serve as the support, the, the reasoning behind the practical exhortation to godly living. Don't ever fall into the trap of thinking that doctrine is impractical, right? Doctrine, doctrine is this, this foundation, this bridge that, well, therefore, really is the bridge between this doctrine, this, these soteriological truths that come before, to these truths about practical sanctification that we'll look at today. And, and frankly, it's so important at the outset that we understand that unless you embrace the message of salvation in Jesus Christ, you have no foundation to build on. Trying to live a good, godly Christian life without first coming to faith in Christ is not only frustrating, it's impossible. If you've never personally asked Jesus Christ to forgive your sins, to wipe away your past, to become your Lord and Savior, today is the day. God will joyfully receive you and give you his grace. But without that, without faith in Christ, much of what we'll see today in 1 Peter will be impossible for you to really grab hold of because it's rooted in the work of Christ on our behalf. Continue on in verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 13 gives us our first outline point, a life of hope. And verses 13 to 16, you're going to see here five kind of rapid fire exhortations. We see the first three here in verse 13. Prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled, and set your hope. And notice how the the first two imperatives serve to support the third. First is prepare your minds. Literally, I think even a better translation, gird the loins of your mind. And this is a, a phrase that's based on the kind of gathering up and fastening up the, the long eastern garments so that they would not interfere with an individual's activities, especially soldiers. In fact, I have a little illustration for you here, courtesy of the... Uh, the art of manliness. So you can kind of see the, the process that you would go through. My original idea, rather than this graphic, was to have John come up. I was going to have a little sheet, you know, and we're going to see if, you know, if, if John was willing to, to gird his loins here in, in church on Sunday. But then I was afraid he actually would be willing to do it. So I thought we, we, better, we better just put the graphic up, stick with that, right? But you see kind of the process here. Basically, you, you turn your tunic into a pair of shorts so that you gain some agility and you're ready for battle. And to gird your loins would be similar to telling someone, roll up your sleeves, hike up your pants, lace up your shoes. But here it's clearly a figure of speech, since the mind doesn't have loins. Peter is relating it to our mental state. He's saying, get your minds ready for action. Prepare your thinking for spiritual battle. Think rightly about obedience. The mindset that's called for in this passage is one of being sober-minded, of having an eternal perspective. And so we might ask, what is it that entangles you? What is it that that trips you up or, or, or slows you down or keeps you from being effective? What is it that you allow to pull your mind, your thoughts away from the things of God? and on to trivial matters. If you don't gird the loins of your mind, you will not be prepared. You will not have spiritual success. You will fall flat on your face. The next is to be sober in spirit. Sober in spirit really equates to self-control. Christians are told to avoid an irresponsible lifestyle of indulgence, We are to exercise discipline over every aspect of our person. Peter uses this same word in uh, chapter 4, verse 7, 
in chapter 5, verse 8, if you look forward, and he uses it to encourage uh, spiritual alertness in prayer, resisting the attacks of the devil, right? Again, being on alert, being sober, being self-controlled, being serious. And the main focus here, then, is to set your hope. And this is a call to live with a sense of confident expectation. Setting your hope is not really a matter of the emotions as much as it is a matter of a disciplined mind that understands, that believes, that embraces the promises of God, the future that Christ has secured for us and then lives in light of those truths. And again, relating this back to its original audience, you see the desperate need that they would have had to have this eternal perspective, this desperate need that they would have had for hope. And maybe even the mention of hope would have made some of these believers scoff a little bit and say, Peter, you, you don't understand. You don't realize what we're going through. Well, certainly Peter did understand. And, and, and Peter's not just saying, you know, hey, everybody, have hope. You know, here's a little Band-Aid and then running off on his way. He's saying have hope and he's rooting it in this doctrine. He's rooting it in these truths that we're seeing this morning. What specifically is our hope to be fixed on? Well, verse 13, it's on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Peter's already spoken of Christ's return in chapter 1. You see in verse 7, uh, verse 5, verse 7, verse 9, He's talking about the return of Christ and, and the ultimate stage of salvation, our glorification. This thing that we long for, this thing that we look to. We have this confident expectation, those of us who know Christ, of eternity and glory. And when you have something as amazing as heaven to look forward to, the temporary struggles of this life, no matter how severe, cannot steal your joy and cannot keep you from a life of obedience. Notice the word completely or fully. Fix your hope completely. This is telling us the extent to which this eternal perspective is expected. Because Christ's return is a compelling motive for obedience through the storms, through the tribulations, through the hardships of life. I heard a phrase as I was studying 1 Peter years ago for the, for the first time, and it, and it stuck with me. It was a new phrase to me. It says, when the outlook is gloomy, the believer needs to try the uplook. I love this, right? The outlook is the surface. The outlook is what we see with, with our minds, right? With, with our, you know, finite vision. It's the circumstances that we get caught up and, and tossed about by. The uplook is an eternal mindset, an eternal perspective. It's a reminder of the, the hope of the return of Christ and the glory that is coming. I'll turn your attention to verses 14 to 16. The second point of our outline, verses 14 to 16, is a life of holiness. A life of hope and a life of holiness. As obedient children, it says in verse 14, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Verse 14 gives us the fourth of our five imperatives. Do not conform. To what? Well, the, the ways of their past sinful lives. Do not conform to our self-centered, selfish, sinful selves, right? Is that enough self for you there? The life of the past, before conversion, before Christ, was, was all about us. Now life is about glorifying Christ and living for him as children of obedience. He's basically saying it, if, if you're God's child, then act like it. Don't live like you did when you were ignorant of God. Be children of obedience. 
The only other time the word conformed is used is in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where we know it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It's not just about what we do, but it's the thoughts that control the behavior. It's the renewing of our mind. One commentator puts it this way, undisciplined minds lead to undisciplined lives. So there's a sense in which Peter is kind of taking us back to kind of root causes, right? Sometimes the, the sin that we see manifested in our life Right? It is really the result or the effect of the thinking that we have in our life. The unbiblical thinking, the, the lies that we are believing. What we think, where we allow our minds to dwell, it matters. And back in verse 15, we see this contrast, right? The contrast to, to disobedient living is to be holy like the one who called you. That calling, right, the one who called you, that calling that we have, this sovereign call of God, his election of each believer, right, how does that relate to our sanctification? Well, again, simply put, those who are called to be God's children are to be like him. Peter reinforces this command by citing Leviticus, uh, one of the uh, really simplest commands, be holy for I am holy. What in the world? I mean, this is right up there with love your wife as Christ loved the church, right? And this is one of those overwhelming things. I mean, this seems a little big for me. And especially we can, when we consider what God's word has to say about God's holiness, we understand this is no small task. And by the way, we're, we're not allowed to, you know, in, in order to make ourselves feel better, in order to make ourselves feel closer to, you know, this command to in some way minimize the holiness of God. No, when it, when it says, be holy for I am holy, we want a, a full picture of the holiness and perfection of God because that's what we're being called to. God's holiness is the perfection of, of God in which he eternally wills and maintains his own moral excellence. In the Old Testament, Kadesh, it's, it's apartness, it's sacredness. In the New Testament, it's hagios, it's set apart, pure, righteous, consecrated, the basic idea of holiness in the Bible is separation from sin. And so when we say that God is holy, we are saying God is completely separate from sin. And in saying that God is perfectly holy and separate from sin, we are calling attention to the most evident and profound difference between the Creator and His creatures. God's holiness is a huge theme in scripture. I, I would commend a study of the holiness of God to you. He's repeatedly referred to as the Holy One. His holiness is celebrated constantly before the heavenly throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I know uh, in, in one church that we were in, I know, you know, this church and, and churches you've all have been in have, have never had this issue, but in one church that we were in, there was kind of an issue of people that wanted uh, kind of some newer, more contemporary music on Sunday mornings, and people who really wanted to stay traditional and, and just keep with the hymns. You'll never believe this. It tended to be divided along demographics of age, right? And uh, somehow we kind of landed in the middle and kind of being on staff, and so, you know, one group of people would come, oh, I don't like this music, and another group would come, well, I don't like this music, and we're trying to kind of, you know, make everyone happy because that's the purpose of church. A <laughs> little, little bit of sarcasm for you there. It's my spiritual gift. Uh, <laughs> and uh, one of the things that would sometimes get complained about, and I, I think maybe fairly so, is, is uh, some of the newer music, uh, the repetition of it, right? And, and sometimes the repetition is kind of purposeful. It's almost like, you know, if we repeat this, you know, long enough, then eventually we'll get the emotion out of you that we're trying to get. And that's a little bit annoying. But one Sunday, a lady came, she said, oh, I, I didn't like that song. It's too repetitious. We're just singing the same thing over and over. And I said, oh, well, I'm sorry, what, uh, what song was it? Oh, you know, that one, that uh, holy, holy, holy one. 
I said, well, I, I think on this particular Sunday and this particular song, you're going to have to give us a pass, right? Because this is what is proclaimed around the throne of God constantly, never-endingly. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God's arm is a holy arm. His name is a holy name. His works are holy works. His promise is a holy promise. Because God is holy, He hates sin. And His holiness is seen in His written law. And ultimately, God's holiness is manifested at the cross. God's perfect holiness and hatred for sin is seen in the fact that He would punish His own Son. Sharnock describes it this way. Never did divine holiness appear more beautiful and lovely than at the, ta- at the time our Savior's countenance was most marred in the midst of his dying groans. This is part of what I hope we'll see in greater depth as we come together on Friday. In verses 15 and 16 of, of 1 Peter 1, God's holiness is stated as a fact. Yours is commanded, right? God's holiness is fact. It's settled. It's perfect. It's unassailable. Ours is commanded, and we continue to strive to be holy in all our behavior because Burkhoff says, again, God abhors sin and demands purity of his moral creatures. And so we're not allowed to lessen this command to bring it down to a level that we can attain or feel comfortable with. It doesn't say, be holy at least more than the person sitting next to you in church. It says, be holy for I am holy. And so this is the call. You say, but I can't do that. And I say, right. That's why we're being reminded of these motivating factors, of these powers that God has given us, of the Holy Spirit that indwells us. And we're going to continue to strive and strive and strive until we drop over dead and God finishes the deal as we are ultimately made practically, positionally, our our, our practice and our position match in glorification when we enter into eternity. And remember that holiness is the primary vehicle by which we honor God. For, For you to pursue holiness, believer, means that you are consciously, actively, daily, setting yourself apart from sin and to God. Are there areas in your life that are in need of being conformed to His holiness? Let me rephrase that. There are areas in your life that are in need of being conformed to His holiness. And as you sit here this morning, and the Spirit helps you to identify those areas, Are you willing to surrender those into his perfect will today? Because you desire to honor God, because you desire to please God above all else. That's the heart of every true believer. And it's our third outline point. Verses 17 to 21, a life of honoring God. Just peruse verses 17 to 21 for me and and, uh, sympathize with me a little bit as we try to you know, kind of uh, get through all of this, that there is so much theology in this section. In fact, there's so much doctrine here that some liberal scholars have used it to question its authenticity. And basically, they say, well, you know, as you read this, like Peter could have made the point that he wants to make with a lot fewer words, with a lot less detail. And so they say probably what happened is later on, you know, some scribes, you know, somebody said, oh, this would be a good place, you know, to to stick some extra doctrine in here to teach people. And so they added that in. D. Edmund Hebert responds. He says, yes, Peter could have made his point in a summary way. But did it occur to these scholars that Peter himself wanted to teach more doctrine? See, the deeper the case is made, the deeper the impact is felt on the life of the hearers. And so Peter's taking us into the doctrinal depths in hopes that it will come out in our living. Verse 17, 
If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. We have to notice in verse 17 the reference to God as our Father. He's our Father because of our new birth. He's our Father because that stresses an intimate relationship. I mean, think of the the biblical language used to describe our relationship with our Heavenly Father. We are His children. We are heirs. We are adopted. We are brothers and co-heirs with Christ. Go to Galatians 4, you see this, right? God is our Abba Father. Christ even taught us to pray, our Father, who is in heaven. I think my my favorite topic in all of theology and doctrine to to study and to teach is the attributes of God, and I try to make a point of finding some excuse, whether it's a, a conference or a convention I go to speak at, or just getting a group of guys together or whatever it is, to find some reason to teach a series on the attributes of God every year. And every time I do, I'm amazed at my mind-blowing God, right? I I come away, you know, grasping to try to understand what I'm reading in Scripture about who our God is, this this infinite God who doesn't fit in my my box, you know, who I can't contain in my little pea brain. And as I'm amazed by this God, and then I come to passages like this, and I realize that Scripture says that this God is my friend, This God is my dad? It's incredible. You know, some some religions are, in their relation to their deity, are static and and impersonal and wooden. Not ours. Make note of this familial relationship. By the way, we're, we're coming up here on a section that will reference the fear of God. And we'll need this understanding of God as our Father, this familial relationship, in order to properly understand the believer's relationship to the fear of God. But also notice here in verse 17, God is described as the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. God is an impartial judge. Peter says in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. God sees the heart. He judges the thoughts and intentions. We think of Samuel going to Jesse's house looking for a king, but but God is looking to little David because God judges the heart. It says in verse 17 that, The unrepentant sinner will not stand in judgment, right? That means that at the last judgment, the the unregenerate will be doomed because of a God who is a righteous judge, who judges accordingly. But remember that even the regenerate, even believers will have their lives evaluated by God and will receive according to what they have done. Or it says we'll suffer loss. And so verse 17 says, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. And we come to that kind of age-old question, should a Christian fear God? I mean, does that fit with what we're talking about of God as our Father and God as our Redeemer and, and Christ who saved us? But we go to the testimony of Scripture to answer the question, right? And we see godly men and women of the Bible consistently, constantly described as God-fearing. Noah, when he's preparing the ark. Abraham, when he's tested in the offering of his son Isaac. Jacob, the midwives of Egypt. Phineas. You think of the the people in Scripture who came kind of face-to-face with some manifestation of the presence of God, and, and what happens? They generally end up on their face, right? Gideon thought he was going to die when he saw the angel of the Lord. Samson's parents had the same reaction. Isaiah, when he has a a vision of God's majesty and glory, says, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And so, yes, of course, 
we should fear God. He is the all-powerful creator of the universe who holds the power of life and death in his very hands. He disciplines his children for sin or rebellion. His holiness is awe-inspiring and coupled with his severe hatred for sin. But on the other hand, no. We don't need to fear God, those of us who are in Christ. We don't need to fear God in regards to judgment. Christians have escaped the judgment of God through Christ. We have nothing to fear on Judgment Day. Jump over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 18. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So for the believer, there's no fear of judgment. The fear of the Lord is a fear of God's displeasure. It's a fear of God's discipline. Remember Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they, they sinned in the church before God. They were judged by God and, and, and had their lives taken. And then it says, great fear came over all who heard it. Yeah, right? People dropping dead in the church service, that'll, that'll get you to fear a great fear. And we might think of an earthly father. A good earthly father can, can be a good example of this, right? It, if you have a good relationship as a child, you run into your father's arms when you see him, and his arms represent the safest place on earth to a child. But on the flip side, children fear their father's discipline. Many, many, many times I heard the words, go to your room and wait for your dad to come home. These are words that inspired terror in the heart of little Matt McGrew. I, there was a little stint, all right, this is confession time. There was a little stint where my parents had a rule, if I got detention at school, I got spanked at home. Which basically meant I got spanked every day of first grade, okay? I don't know, it just, there was so much fun to be had in school at the wrong times. And so, yeah, so a lot of spankings. And, and I remember, you know, just going up to my room and just waiting and hearing my dad's car pull into the driveway, and hearing the car door shut, and hearing the front door open, and the front door shut, and hearing the little voices at the bottom of the stairs, rah, 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 you know, my mother telling, telling on me, ratting me out, right? And my dad's footsteps coming up the stairs, right? I love my father. I don't think of myself as, you know, uh, having a, a fearful relationship with my father, and yet at those moments, when discipline was necessary, there was fear with it. A proper kind of respect, a proper kind of fear. And so God disciplines us because we're not illegitimate children. We are his sons by adoption through Christ. And so he treats us as sons. By the way, as I think of this story of the, the car pulling into the driveway and everything, it, it, it dawned on me this week, this entire scenario is made a little less intimidating and dramatic now in retrospect when I remember what kind of car my father drove as he pulled into the driveway in his Volkswagen Bug. <laughs> this is not a particularly intimidating car, but that was lost on me in first grade, so I'm just reflecting on that now. So <laughs> so in verse 17, when we talk about fear, we're, we're talking about the reverent fear of a believer. One commentator describes it this way, reverent fear is evidenced by a tender conscience, a watchfulness against temptation, and avoiding things that would displease God. Children of obedience should always be strangers to their former empty way of life, which we just saw in verse 14. When we live in the fear of God, it leads us to <laughs> sanctification. And 2 Corinthians 7 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 
The true worshiper comes into the presence of God in healthy, reverent fear. Verses 18 and 19 then, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Verse 18 brings into the discussion this great word, redemption. We've entitled this entire message, The life, Lifestyle of Salvation. And our outline is a life of hope, a life of holiness, and a life of honoring God. And all of that is coming out of the therefore in verse 13, right? So all of this is a result, is a response really to our salvation, to our redemption. The Christian life is lived out of the knowledge of the redemption that Christ accomplished for us. And so we preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Redemption comes from several Greek terms that, that basically mean to, to set free by the payment of a price. And in ancient Rome, people became slaves in different ways, through war, through bankruptcy, voluntarily sometimes selling themselves into servitude. But slaves had the opportunity to, to save and sometimes to earn extra money on the side or to find someone who would help them to pay a price and to free themselves from their bondage, from their servitude. And a freed man was a person who had formerly been a slave but was now redeemed. And so for us, the word redemption emphasizes Christ setting the believer free from the penalty and power of sin. And the ransom that was paid involves Christ's suffering and his death, and it satisfies God's holy justice. And verse 19 says that Christ is without blemish and without spot, this reference to the, the sinlessness of Christ. And so Christ's substitutionary death enables God to be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Romans chapter 3. And what were we bought out of? Well, we're bought from, verse 18, a futile way of life. This describes life apart from the Lord. It's futility. Paul specifically here is speaking to Jewish believers. So why would he call the life that they inherited futile? Well, because they had so twisted the law and added to the law and, and caused it to become a system of works righteousness, which it was never intended to be. And Peter is saying, you were saved from this futile way of life. A futile way of life that teaches that you can be good enough, try hard enough, climb high enough, reach to God. But there is no biblical scenario in which tradition or good deeds get you into heaven. Because God has no grandchildren. No one was ever redeemed through a system of works like baptism or sacraments. And if we add anything to the precious blood of Christ, we are constructing a road to hell. And a false gospel. Because redemption is only through Jesus Christ. And it's incredible to read here that we have freedom from our futile way of life. We can be free from the bonds of sin. We can be made a new creature in Christ. Whatever your past holds, no matter what it is, no matter what shame is there, no matter what family history there is, we can be free in Christ. When you come to Christ, you get a fresh start. You get a, a, a do-over. And that's redemption. Look at the description in verse 19, Peter's trying to remind us here of the infinite value of the precious shed blood of Christ. Do we consider this daily? Do we take the value of Christ's life and death on our behalf for granted? I saw a video a while back, and uh, it's kind of one of those man on the street kind of a things. It's this conservative commentator. And uh, he's trying to make a point, which generally is probably, uh, you know, look how bad off the world is, right? <laughs> and, uh, but he's doing kind of a fun thing. As people would walk by him on the corner, he would, he would hold up both hands and he would say, hey, I want to give you one of these. And he would offer them, in one hand, a Hershey's chocolate bar, and in the other hand, a bar of silver, roughly the same size. And I watched as person after person 
after a person chose the candy bar. Why? Mm, they didn't know anything about the silver. They didn't know the, the value of the bar of silver. Some people said, uh, I'll take the chocolate bar. And uh, he said, uh, why? And they said, well, I know what that is. I know I can eat that. And one person said, uh, I'll take the chocolate bar. And he pointed the bar of silver. He said, I don't know what I would do with that. And as he said that, the cameraman panned up to show that they were standing in front of the exchange shop. And literally, this man could have taken the bar of silver, walked about five steps, and traded it for $150. But you see, people didn't see the value that was right in front of their face. And so here we are. And Peter is, is putting it right in front of our face. He's saying, do you understand the preciousness of the blood of Christ? Do you understand the value of the death of the God-man, Jesus Christ? It is so valuable that it could rid a filthy sinner like you of all your guilt. And verses 18 and 19 are causing us to think about our redemption because thinking about our redemption, thinking about the value of Christ's death, leads us to purity. It leads us to service. It leads us to worship and holiness and good deeds and, and all these things that Peter's trying to motivate us to. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Why? Because you've been bought with a price. Titus 2.14 says, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Christ brings us to salvation for a reason, for a purpose, that we might serve and worship and honor and glorify him. Look at verse 20 and 21 as we wrap up here. It says, For he, has foreknown before the, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Christ was foreknown, foreordained. The plan all along from eternity past was that Christ would be the Redeemer. And then in the fullness of time, the preexistent Christ appeared in human history we read in the Gospel of John, John the Baptist declares, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And verse 21, it's through Christ, whom the Father resurrected and glorified in his ascension, that people can know and trust in God and find salvation. Through him. Emphasizes that Christians are what they are only because of their personal experience with Christ. Wesley said, without Christ, we should only dread God, whereas through him we believe and hope and love. Faith can be placed in our God, and a life of hope comes from him. Notice faith, uh, verse 5, verse 7, verse 9, hope, verse 3, and verse 13. Faith causes us to trust God through all the junk of life. And hope causes us to look to the glorious future that Christ has secured for us. And what we're seeing here in these final two verses is that Christ's resurrection is the foundation of our faith and his glorification is the pledge of the hope that we have in a future. So what is the lifestyle of salvation? It's a life of hope, a life of holiness, and a life of honoring God. Peter wants us to see the precious blood of the Lamb slain for us and remember the great price that was paid to redeem us. And the love of the Father and the blood of Christ should motivate us to holy living. As C.T. Studd put it this way, If Christ be God and died for me, there is nothing too great that I can do for him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for 
reminders. That motivate me, Lord, to evaluate my own life, my own lifestyle, my, the, the, the week that's gone by, the week ahead. Father, help us as individuals, help us as a body to desire to be conformed to the image of your Son, to live in hope. Father, there are a lot of hardships, a lot of struggles represented in this room this morning. And yet, in Christ, we have hope. We have a future. We thank you so much for that glorious truth. Now, Father, spur us on to be serious-minded, to be sober, to be self-controlled, and to be holy as you are holy, and to continue striving for that until you take us home. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.